Giving to God motivates us to give what's right to other people, encouraging us to obey God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. As we discover the Bible, the most important book of all right here, and we do that, I encourage you to do it with us every year. We're doing it for 34 years. We're going to study the 16th chapter of First Chronicles in about three minutes time. A very good study today. Corey? Well, today we're taking a look at the House of David in the Scripture and the House of David in History. Ryan? Well, today I'm jumping ahead to 1 Chronicles 21 because there are some challenges between this chapter and the parallel passages in Samuel. And so I'm going to be dealing with one of these challenges today and the other challenge tomorrow. Stay tuned. Yeah, it's going to be very good. Look forward to that. Janice? Two things that I like, Rod. Food and fellowship. All right. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we begin to study. Let's open the Bible and listen to what God says. First Chronicles 16, 1 through 13. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel, Asaph the chief, and next to him Zechariah, then Jehiel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, and Obed-Edom. Jehiel with stringed instruments and harps, but Asaph made music with cymbals. Benaiah and Jehaziel the priests regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. On that day David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren, to thank the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing psalms to Him, talk of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth, O seed of Israel his servant, you children of Jacob his chosen ones. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. We continue uh, through these historical books. And uh, it really is good. Today, we're going to focus on 1 Chronicles chapter 16. This is an interesting time of scripture, an interesting time of listening to the Lord. And in 1 Chronicles 16, we see how David organized worship to be done before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, keep in mind that the Ark of the Covenant was created by Moses and his people at the instruction of God, and it represented the presence of God. And after their initial celebration, David ensured that the continuous music and praise would be surrounding the ark and the tent that housed it. Now, the names of the worshiping and the attending Levites are recorded here, and their jobs are described as commemorating or thanking and praising God. In other translations, the word commemorate is translated as extol invoke or petition. First Chronicles 16 then goes on to record David's song of praise that he wrote for this purpose. And we know from the book of Psalms that it wasn't just David who wrote the Psalms, but the ministering Levites themselves. I love these examples of song singing that the Bible gives us. You know, music is such a powerful method of communication, the sound of our soul, really. And God not only tells us to sing a new song, 
but he also helps us find lyrics. God has preserved these ancient examples to teach us and to guide us and to help us when we struggle to find our own words. God gives us the ability and the power to uh, say things and to sing things. You know, music is the sound of our soul. It is an amazing, absolutely stunning thing. And one of the unfortunate things about this is when money gets wrapped into all of this and everybody's focused on the money. Music is the communication to God. And if you listen to Christian music, you know that some of it is uh, more about themselves, but you will find there is music there that the Holy Spirit has inspired of God writing. And so God writes this music and to sing a new song becomes a whole new level of understanding God. It's very, very interesting. Now, as we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord. Take your Bible guide and turn there. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can call us or you can write to us and uh, we'll send you one. Be happy to do that. It cost us money to do that. Another way you can do this is go to Bible Discovery TV, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Or you can go to Bible Discovery Guide, BibleDiscoveryGuide.com. And when you go there, it takes you to a donate page. Thank you so much for your donations. They keep us alive. And we want to thank you for that. Uh, That's very, very interesting. But today, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, as I look at these scriptures, I see that you're speaking. Your Holy Spirit talks to us and we need to hear you. So help us to hear you, Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Now, let's look at this because this gets interesting. 16 verse one. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Look at that. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. How did he do that? Well, then he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Do you understand that offerings of praise to God motivates us to give to others around us? The Bible teaches that living in thanks and praise to God changes our attitudes. That's really different today because we're all focused on, well, the inflation. We got to keep every penny inside. Don't give it to anybody. Hold on a minute. When we give to God, that's a very different experience. We put our trust in the provision of Jesus Christ, in the ability of God to respond to us. And let me tell you something. I promise you this. He will respond to you. He always does. He has always done it and he will always do it. He takes care of our needs. Isn't that interesting? Well, uh, this is fascinating. Let's go on and read more. It says, and he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him was Zechariah, then Jael, and Shemarath, Jehiel, Matthiah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed-Edom, Jael, with stringed instruments and harps, And Asaph made music with cymbals, and Benaniah and Jehaziah, the priest, regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Did you see that? You see, David assigned regular musicians to worship and praise God. The greatest music that we can make is for the Lord. The greatest music we can ever make is for the Lord. I want you to understand when we hear music on the radio, somebody singing about somebody who loves somebody, somebody who loves somebody else, or somebody did something wrong and I lost my pickup truck and I lost my dog and everything else. But when you hear music that says the Lord God changed my life, 
helped me, healed me, took me, gave me life. That is stunning. It is amazing. When we sing to God, there is nothing. The enemy hates that music. But God says, sing to me a new song. Praise my name. 150 times in the Bible he gave it to us. Psalm 100 through 50. Anyway, let's read on. It says here, on that day, David first delivered this psalm to the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Here's what he said. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name and make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who rejoice seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Listen to that. Listen to verse 12. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done. His wondrous and, and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. We play and we sing music of God for all to hear. But God is our audience. We are never alone. God is always with us. You know, I know there's people who talk about their music and they talk about, well, we had this audience and that audience, but that's great. But, you know, we only need an audience of one. Audience of God Almighty. Audience of Elohim. Audience of El Shaddai. This audience of God is amazing. May we sing our music to the Lord, the audience of one, the most important of all of audiences. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today, and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. All right, First Chronicles 17 is what you and I are gonna focus on today. And this is a really interesting chapter where, of course, we get this interaction between David and God. Uh, David is speaking to God and God is speaking to David through the prophet Nathan. And it's about this impulse that David has. He, he feels guilty that he has this beautiful, paneled, expensive palace in Jerusalem and he hasn't built a temple for God, which is something that kings would regularly do. They would honor their gods and set up uh, monuments for them and things like this. So I feel like this is a natural impulse that David has. He wants to show his love for God. But we see God really kind of putting David in his place about who does the actual building and what God requires of David. And it's God does not require a physical building to live in. And God's words are so interesting. He's, he, he says, basically, I have built you and I will build you a house, David. And of course, by house, God didn't mean another palace. He meant a dynasty. So a house was a physical thing in the ancient world, but it was also a dynasty, a lineage of kings. Uh, take a look at some of the historical evidence for David. That King David existed as a historical person was settled in the 1990s. The discovery of the partial remains of a monumental stella at Tel Dan, the first fragment in 1993 and the second in 1994, coincided with a re-examination of another stella called the Mesha inscription or Moabite stone. Both monuments were erected by enemies of Israel and Judah, and both mention the royals of Judah as belonging to the House of David. In a phrase like House of David, the house is not a literal building, but is metaphorical, referring to the dynasty of a founding father, the descendants of an establishing king. Famously, the Bible records that God promised to build David a house, again, meaning a lineage, not a physical palace. 
The Tel Dan Stella is named for the city it was discovered in. We know it today only in part from those fragments found in secondary use in the early 90s. Scholars deduce from its contents and age that it was written by Hazael of Damascus, an Aramean king of the city-state of Damascus that's featured heavily in the Bible and had great success warring against Israel and Judah. The inscription commemorated his victories over Israel and Judah and would have stood in the gate of Dan for decades until the city was recaptured by Israel's King Jehoash and likely at that point smashed into its fragments and reused as building materials. Its fragments today record whole, partial, and implied names of several biblical kings and lists the kings of Judah as of the house of David. The House of David is also referred to in the Mesha inscription that records the same event from a different perspective as 2 Kings chapter 3. This inscription was commissioned by Mesha, king of Moab, enemy of Israel and Judah, at that time ruled by Joram and Jehoshaphat. The inscription also mentions Omri, verifies that Chemosh was the Moabite national deity, and several other elements of Moabite culture mentioned in the scriptures. Interestingly, there's also a disputed mention of David's name recorded in a victory inscription of Pharaoh Shishak, who attacked Judah during the reign of David's grandson Rehoboam. This Egyptian inscription refers to a portion of Judah as the Heights of David. There are also several lines of physical evidence for David's kingdom to be found in archaeological data from the 10th century BC. In a newly released study, scholar Josef Garfinkel brings together excavation reports and archaeological surveys from four sites to argue that evidence for a centralized government in Judah during David's reign can be demonstrated. Garfinkel believes that the core of David's kingdom began with four cities before expanding ever outwards, a picture that melds well with the biblical account. Garfinkel's excavations also revealed evidence for the architectural style of Solomon's temple in the form of a small shrine, and for the Bible's record of King Rehoboam's building activities. Now I know this is old news, but how awesome is it that the first concrete historical, uh, uh, you know, verification of David is the phrase House of David? I just think it's so cool in light of the promise that we read today in 1 Chronicles 17 that God says, no, David, I will build you a house. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> very important to remember that God reminded David that he never really asked for a house, mm -hmm. that David said, I want to, I want to build a house. And God said, I don't need a house. I told Moses, build me a tabernacle, mm -hmm. but you know, you won't build it. Your son will build it. Very, very interesting stuff here. Fascinating. Okay, Ryan. All right. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, First Chronicles 21 presents us with some challenges because the parallel accounts in Samuel seem to contradict Chronicles at certain points. And I'm going to be dealing with these challenges over the next couple of days. And the first challenge has to do with First Chronicles 21 verse 1, which says that it was an adversary and quite possibly the adversary himself, Satan, who enticed King David to sin by taking a census of Israel. But back in the parallel account of 2 Samuel 24, it says that it was God who enticed David to number the people. So the question is, who was it that enticed David to sin, God or an adversary? While the Bible unashamedly proclaims itself to be God's word thousands of times, hundreds of apparent contradictions are held up by its critics as evidence against those declarations. Yet closer inspection of said inconsistencies reveals no true errors at all. For example, one of the supposed conflicts is found between the parallel passages of 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21. 2 Samuel 24 verse 1 says that because God was angry with Israel, he incited David to take a census of Israel and Judah, which was a sin in the Lord's eyes. But then in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, which records the very same event, it says that it was an adversary, and very possibly the adversary Satan, who incited David to number the people. So who was it that enticed David to sin, God or the adversary? This alleged difficulty is just a simple case of cause and effect. In one verse, God is the cause of the outcome or the effect, but in the other verse, the adversary is the cause of the outcome. 
Though at first glance this appears to be problematic, to claim that these two verses are contradictory commits a logical fallacy known as bifurcation, which assumes that a given effect must have only one cause. But in actual fact, most events have multiple causes. Take rain for example. What is it that causes rain? Is it moisture in the air? The air temperature dropping below the dew point? A cold front? Gravity pulling on the water droplets? Natural forces? Or God? Well, obviously, all these things cause rain, and yet they are not contradictory. As another example, consider the Bible. Was scripture written by God or by men? The correct answer is both. Men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God to do so. In the same way, it can be said without any contradiction that both God and an adversary enticed David to sin. But does this then mean that God is responsible for David's sin? Of course not. As scripture reveals elsewhere, God himself never commits evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God was not David's tempter. But because the Lord was angry, he didn't prevent the adversary from tempting David either. And it is in that sense that both God and the adversary provoked David to sin. Of course, David still had a choice. He could have resisted the temptation, but instead he chose to sin as God knew he would, and God appropriately punished David and Israel for their sins. And yet, this was all in accordance with God's purpose, because this episode ultimately led to David purchasing the plot of land on which the future temple and temples would be built. Far from a contradiction, this is just one of many instances in the Bible in which God used evil and sinful agents to accomplish his purposes. And we must never forget that God is sovereign and ultimately overrules sinful activity for his glory and the ultimate good of mankind. So as you can see, there's no contradiction here because an effect can have more than one cause. In this case, David's sin was the effect and it had more than one cause, namely God and an adversary. No, God himself wasn't the one who tempted David, but in his sovereignty, he allowed David to be tempted by an adversary. In this way, it can be said without the slightest contradiction that both God and an adversary enticed David. And with that problem solved, we'll deal with another one tomorrow. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Jen. Well, food and fellowship was what I titled my segment today. You know, David had been anointed king, and now God's Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, was placed in the tabernacle, and great praise was given to God, and joy was had by all who attended and gave praise to God. When we look at this, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 3 is what I want to look at for a minute. Then he, meaning King David, distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread and a piece of meat and a cake of raisins. And you know, I, so often I think about, you know, Food goes with fellowship all the time, doesn't it? And uh, I think we lost some of that in the last few years when churches were being shut down. And, and we need to restore food and fellowship within our members, don't we? We, we have the best times when we put those together. But I love how the Holman Christian Study Bible puts it around this verse. It says, David's coronation banquet had been a carry in dinner. But now when David blessed the people and sent them home, each person received a small packet of food. You know, it's a, it's a carry home dinner. And um, then when we see that David did this, he gave everyone, every man, every woman, these items of food. Then David had Asaph and the musicians thank God with a psalm that he had written and delivered to them. Now, you can see parts of this psalm in Psalm 105, verses 1 through 15. You can see it in Psalm 96, verses 1 through 13, and also the very beginning verse of Psalm 106.1. And at the end of this beautiful psalm, this song that was that was done by Asaph and his musicians, it says in the final verse of this chapter, and all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. What a celebration that would have been, Rod. It, it reminds Food me of and a... fellowship. Yeah, it, and <laughs> it's fascinating. It reminds me of a story of a, a gentleman who uh, went to church, and this happened recently, and there was a pastor in a church, and they were taking an offering, and so... This man was very wealthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's sitting in the back and he comes in with like five of his people and he 
takes the offering, and the man pulls out a whack of $20 bills and hands it to everybody and says, put it in the offering. <laughs> he wanted the people to have something to give. To be able to participate. And that kind of reminds me of the story here. And David responds to God and says, I want to give people something to give. I want to make sure they can give. And that becomes very important. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because the pastor said, I never commented on anything, but I just afterwards, I said, I thanked him. And I said, man, that's that was amazing what you did. And and that's the point of this. When we live in a world where everybody's taking mm. and everybody's grabbing what they can get. I want that. I want that. And they're taking because somebody might rip it from you, you know. And I think that when we serve God, we recognize that God is going to give us everything that nobody can steal from us. Mm. They can't steal our soul from us. We give our soul to God. He is the one who renews it. He's the one who makes it live. He's the one who gives us that life. Nobody can take that life. God gave it. Nobody can take it away. We need to think about that. And so as we do that, keep that in mind. And Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, because there's people watching who have kind of thought this way. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to them and help us to understand, Father, that we are people who've been given eternal life because you love us and you keep us safe. And so, Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus that you would remind us of who you are. You are the God of our soul, the God who gives us life. I have put together six sermons that I did just for you on Zechariah, this prophet of God about the times that we live in and I want to offer them to you and all of that. Go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com or call us and uh, you can get a hold of yours. Very good. Let's pray. Lord, I love you and I will praise your name and I will praise your name forever in Jesus' name. And we said this together, amen.